Good morning, church. How are we? Are we okay? The mystery of God's glory with a beautiful snow that's outside. You know, I was reading something that every snowflake is different. Every snowflake is different. If that doesn't point to the glory of the Lord, nothing does. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, let me see if I can turn this on. Give me a second. You recognize me. Praise God. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Everybody hungry for God's word this morning? Yes, good. Turn with me to 2 Samuel 7. 2 Samuel 7. We'll be reading, reading from verse 4 to 16. So 2 Samuel 7, 4 to 16. A meal's taken eye, so when you're there, just shout ear, you know, so I know you're there. That's all I've got. (laughs) Okay. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Have I not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day? I have been moving from place to place, a tent is my dwelling. The living God was dwelling in a tent. And wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the name of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people shall not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He will... He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love, who will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Holy Spirit, I just pray that anything that goes out from me today is from you and not from me. Lord, I pray that the hearts that you have prepared for hearing this message this morning also give them the courage to be able to put this into practice in their lives, Lord Jesus. Have your way and receive all the glory in your holy name, I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, headed by the Queen, Elizabeth II, the English monarchy is one of the oldest monarchies in the world. Now, according to the royal family's website, The family can be traced all the way back to William the Conqueror, which would make our current queen, Queen Elizabeth II, the great, 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 see where this is going, great, great, great granddaughter of William the Conqueror, who was declared King of England in 1066 and who can and who can be traced even further back to when the romans actually invaded england in 43 a.d some homework for you on top of reading the bible of course daily is trace the royal family back all the way to 43 a.d and see how many greats actually go in, after going in front of queen elizabeth ii before you'd make her the granddaughter 
there are actually those who believe that the Queen's roots can be actually traced even further back than that. You ready? Some actually believe that the royal family's roots can be traced back to the royal family of Israel. Some actually believe Her Majesty is actually a descendant of King David. Now, I need to add this morning that the royal family declined to be interviewed for this sermon this morning. And neither do they acknowledge it or know that it's true. And the Bible most certainly doesn't highlight that that's actually true. But it's a very interesting thought, don't you think? Regardless of who our earthly monarchy is, whether it's in Malaysia, whether it's in the UK, wherever it is across the globe, we have a sovereign King God in Lord Jesus who is never advocating the phone throne, who is always seated on the throne. We've been walking through the, the series of covenants, and this morning I'd like to spend a bit of time with you this morning just to go through the Davidic covenant together. And that's the covenant of kingship and what it highlights to us. This covenant with David is actually underpinned by God's promises. David's transportation of the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem made the city the centre of Israelites' worship. And that tells us in 2 Samuel 6, 1-2. And with David as king and the entire nation under his control, the government centralised in Jerusalem. No ex- there was no external enemies at the time. And it tells us at the start of this chapter we've just read. David expresses his desire to build a building to house the ark in verse 3. Nathan encourages David to build, but the Lord had other plans for David and his life. And he had other plans for a person to build and ordained the building of the temple. And this is where we pick up our scripture today. We have to recognize in the scripture that we've just read that the actual word covenant isn't used or it isn't mentioned in the scripture. However, Psalm 89, three to four tells us, you said, I have made my covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. Psalm 23 is a chapter that I just return to over and over and over again. It's one of those chapters that is just a beautiful picture of the Lord, but also brings so much comfort and the Lord's promises as well. And the poetry within Psalm 23 is just absolutely beautiful. And I challenge anybody really to to find a single piece of poetry that's piercing the heart as much as that on the same level as Psalm 23 today. It will be hard to find. David's faith was always the way to his victory. It's a critical detail of the story because it explains one of the reasons that David David established, sorry, God established David and his dynasty. The first thing that the covenant of David shows us is God's kindness will increase your favour. Look at verse 8 to 9. Now then, Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have taken you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. You see, David wasn't always faithful to God. But here, David was being reminded of the faithfulness God had showed him. From his youth, he was being reminded of being taken from the fields as a shepherd and that he had been anointed to become king of Israel. And one of the most famous names across the planet. And each one of those favours of increase, the increases in favour, sorry, was a step in the new destination. From the fields into the city, of Jerusalem and onto the whole earth, all new destinations in the physical. But David had to take physical steps to activate spiritual moves, which then in turn activated those increases in favour. David placed huge value on his anointing and on the grace on his life. He took it very seriously. Psalm 1193 tells us, Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. David activated divine favour by walking a life of obedience, long obedience in seeking God. 
And these brought about increases in favours and increases in blessings. Because when David avoided obedience, it set in motion or it activated a series of events, starting with Bathsheba, that displeased the Lord. And that leads to Nathan's prophecy that the the sword shall never depart from your house. It brought about a curse on him and his household. David recognised that one of the activation points for favour was walking in righteousness. As Psalm 5.12 tells us, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favour as with a shield. The God of heaven is our defence when we walk in righteousness. You see, the supernatural, it controls the physical. Our access into the realm of the supernatural then gives us power within the physical realm. Mark 9 tells us that the disciples tried to cast out an evil spirit from the boy, but they couldn't do it. Then Jesus did do it. And he explained that that kind of spirit can only be cast out by prayer, and in some translations, prayer and fasting. These were steps of activation. In 2010, Elijah I'm not even speaking in tongues now, but Elijah Jajaja Jajoko. Does anybody remember 2010, the ash cloud, the volcano? Does anybody remember that? The volcano, the ash cloud that caused all the disruptions. Some people were doubly blessed and they got stuck out in Lanzarote and Tenerife for an extra three weeks on top of their holidays. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that just because that volcano was dormant leading up to 2010, that it didn't mean it had, it didn't mean that it lost any of its power within it? And that once a series of events had started to activate the power, then it would reach the point of eruption. Of course not. Because of, just because a volcano is dormant, it doesn't mean it loses its power to erupt. It means the power just hasn't been activated. Romans 8, 9 to 11. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Church, everybody say this out loud. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the, by the same spirit. I need a volunteer. I'm going to use Julo because he's very close to what I need a volunteer for. Can you just pick up that bag, Julo, please? And uh, just take out whatever's in there. If you can shake it as hard as you can, if you can aim it at me, and, and, yeah, shake it as hard, yes, please. Shake it as hard as you can and aim it at me. And undo the lid, isn't it? You're not going to do it, no? Why don't you want to do it? You'll get wet. Okay, okay, thank you, brother, thank you. And here lies the issue. We become fearful of activating the power within and the favour on our lives because we're fearful of what might happen to somebody or we're fearful of what people might think or we're fearful that we, of the people that we might lose on the journey. Some of us potentially are even fearful of the people that we might actually gain on the journey in our lives when we actually have to shake and activate the power that's within us. We can have the Holy Spirit without measure. God doesn't measure the Spirit to you. But as with Christ, he gives us the spirit without measure. It's through our own disobedience, church, that you measure it to yourself. If I had another bottle of Coke here now, which I don't because it's underneath my chair. If I had another bottle of Coke here now and was to give it to you and said to you, pour some. I think some of you would be polite and probably pour a little bit. Some of you would probably be a little bit less polite and maybe pour half of it. Who would actually pour it all and give yourself all when it's been given to you as a gift? Who would actually pour the whole lot? Pour yourself some without measure. 
David obeyed the Lord. He knew righteousness activated favour. He knew prayer activated favour. He also recognised that sowing into another person who is anointed activated favour. David, for years and years and years, sowed into the life of King Saul. And King Saul wasn't always good to David. David had the chance to to kill King Saul when he was on the run from him. But David was so devoted to God. David was so devoted to God's word. And he, and he knew and believed so much that the promises of God would come to pass. That David didn't take the opportunity to kill him. God chooses who he wants. God places who he wants where he wants. And that should give you the realisation of total and utter freedom to be able to sow into the life and not be jealous of a person where the Lord has placed them and what they have asked them to do. You might be thinking, I've got nothing to offer. I've, I've, I'm too small. Like I'm, a, I'm a small fish in, in a large pond. We give out on the vision evening. We, we put things up and ask you to pray about what you could do within the kingdom of the Lord. And, and potentially you might think you're too small. But let me tell you something, church. A small rock on the ground is just a small rock. But when that small rock is picked up by anointed, an anointed person, an anointed boy who is due to be king of Israel, the favour that seeps through him onto that rock is put into a slingshot and that small rock takes down giants. So you are not too small. You are not too tiny. So Christ obeyed the Father in all things that he did for his will, for the Father's will. When we do this as believers today, then the spirit is given without measure. So walk in obedience in the physical. Walk in righteousness in the physical. So time into somebody that you recognize as anointed and pray and it will activate the spiritual realm on your behalf. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And you watch the favour in all areas of your life increase and increase and increase. And that leads me on to the second point. What the Lord establishes shall not be overcome. 11b to 13 tells us, The Lord declares to you, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Blessings and promises to the family of David and prosperity These promises related to Solomon, David's immediate successor in the royal line of Judah, who alone built the material house, but ultimately of Christ, who is the builder of God's spiritual house. What was the flip side of the coin to to blessings? Can anybody remember? Oh, that hurts. That hurts. That hurts deep. Curses. It's curses. David had another son. Well, David had lots of children, but he had another son. In fact, in particular, the third son with Maka, Absalom. And it's highly noted that Absalom was one of David's favourites, if not his favourite. That Absalom was a favourite of the people. His charming manners and his personal beauty, it all captivated the heart of the people. He lived in great style. He drove round in the limousine of his day, a magnificent chariot. He had 50 men that run ahead of him. Before him, you could say that Absalom had favor of his father. You could say that Absalom had the favor of his people. You could say Absalom had favor with being physically blessed. But there was a very, very sharp contrast between Absalom's physical beauty and his spiritual poverty. His blessings were not his downfall. But more his lack of spirituality was his downfall. On the outside, yes, great, Absalom, you look fantastic, great hair, look good, well done, buddy. But, but he didn't have what it takes on the inside. 
And that's, and that's what the Lord considers most important. 1 Samuel 6.17 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the Amen, amen, the heart. 2 Samuel 15, 1 to 6 tells us that Absalom began to undermine his father's authority while advancing his own. David's love, David's patience, David's mercy for his favourite son was not at all appreciated by Absalom. Absalom was blinded by his ambition. Absalom was blinded and had a thirst for glory that just could not be satisfied to the point of where he rebelled against what the Lord had established and his anointed one, David, the king of Israel. Absalom, for his rebellion, had plans to rise up against his father and to overthrow him. And and it does gain him the upper hand, but it's only a temporary upper hand because man can build nothing that is worthwhile or lasting. But what the Lord establishes shall not be overcome. God is patient with us like David was patient to Absalom. And men take God's patience as a license to live in rebellion against him. While rebellion might look good, while rebellion might smell good, while rebellion might taste good, and while rebellion might even seem successful for a little while, stubborn, unrepented rebellion will result in wrath and it will result in judgment, trials and tribulation and distress. It's ironic, I find it ironic that the boy shepherd, anointed king, was unable to shepherd his own son. In fact, Absalom had David on the ropes. 2 Samuel 15, 13 to 23 says, sorry, 13, a message came and spoke with David. A messenger came and spoke with David. He told him, the hearts of the Israelites are turned towards Absalom. Then David spoke to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem. He said, come on, we have to leave right away. If we, if we don't, none of us will escape from Absalom. He'll move quickly to catch us up, catch up with us. He'll destroy, his men will kill Everyone in the city with their swords, the king's officials answered him, you are our king and master. We're ready to do anything you want. When's the last time we got on our knees and prayed out to Jesus and said to him, you are our king, you are our master. We are ready to do anything that you want. Absalom had David fleeing from Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley and all the way back across the Jordan River to the city of Mananaim. David is the king of Israel right now, but he doesn't look like it at all right now. But just because David isn't sitting specifically on the throne doesn't mean that David wasn't king. David was just regrouping. David was just reconnecting. David was just re-immobilizing. David was just getting ready to retake and to get back into Jerusalem and rebuild. The word Mananim in Hebrew means Aya, which means I am. The very city David is in, while he's regrouping, while he's reconnecting, while he's re-immobilizing, while he's getting ready, re-ready to take and rebuild, is called I am. The statement of the very nature of God. Church, COVID-19 is our Absalom. It may look like God's people and the church of Jesus Christ is retreating at the moment. It may look like the church of Jesus Christ is losing position right now. It may look like the world is winning and it has forced us across the Kidron Valley. It's forced us back across to the Jordan River, into the city of Manaheim. But God is reminding us, just as he was reminding David at the time, I am, I am, I am. I am still king. I am still on the throne. I am still the Lord your God. I am still your deliverer. I am still the Holy One of Israel. I am still the Lamb who was slain for you. I am the groom of my church. This is Christ's church. We are Christ's church. We are just regrouping. We are just reconnecting. We are just remobilizing. We are just getting ready to retake. We are getting ready to rebuild. And we are getting ready to be fruitful. 
Absalom met his demise as a result of his rebellion to try and overthrow what the Lord had established in the forest of Ephraim. Ephraim means being fruitful. The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 18 that David didn't want Absalom killed, but Joab took it upon himself to kill him. As we come back across the Jordan, as we come back into the land to retake and rebuild, we're coming back to be fruitful. We're coming back to be fruitful in our lives. We're coming back to be fruitful in our communities. We're coming back to be fruitful through the nations. When we come back across, we don't do it like, we, like Joab done it, but we come back across with the same intention as David. We come back across with the intention that David had towards Absalom with acts of love. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everybody who hangs on the tree. Absalom was unrepentant in his rebellion and in his pride. And what was his glory, his appearance, his appearance had him hanging by a tree, by his hair, just waiting for Joab to come along and kill him. I have to believe that if Absalom had recognised his rebellion, if he had recognised his pride against his father and he had gone to David and asked for forgiveness, David would have fully forgiven him of his rebellion and of his pride. We have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful foreshadow of our Lord Jesus Christ here. He became a curse for us and he has redeemed us by hanging on a tree over 2,000 years ago. If you recognise your rebellion, if the Holy Spirit has highlighted some pride within you this morning, if you recognise anything that shouldn't be there, come to the tree. Come to the cross. Repent because he's faithful to forgive. Jesus he won't leave you hanging by your pride between heaven and earth. He will release you. He will set you free. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. And he will establish your feet firmly on the rock, on the rock of salvation, on the rock of himself, on the solid rock on which we stand. Which leads me on to the last point as I get attacked by a table. Leads me on to the last point. God can turn your mistakes into something glorious. 2 Samuel verse 13, until 16, sorry. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. As we've seen, these promises relate to Solomon. David's immediate successor and the royal line of Judah. Everything that happens in this world happens within the sphere of God's working. The famous verse in Genesis 50, 20, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Almost a beautiful, beautiful prophecy from Joseph about the royal line of Judah leading all the way to Jesus. Solomon was born from Bathsheba. We're all aware, or majority of us are aware, of the story of David and Bathsheba and how they got together. If you don't, you'll find the story in 2 Samuel 11. I encourage you to reread it and re-familiarise yourself with it. In the meantime, I'll give you a very, very quick rundown. David saw Bathsheba taking a bath. He impregnated her, and he sent her husband directly to the front line where he was killed in action. Drama, right? Worse than Emma Day, all right? Yeah, drama. And it all started with cracks of compromise from David. David would, David should have known better and being aware of Adam and Eve and what had taken place in the fall. But yet Satan used precisely the same tactic against David as he did with Eve in the garden. Genesis, 
Ephesians, sorry, tells us that give no opportunity to the devil. Ephesians 4, 27, give no opportunity to the devil. David gave an opportunity to the devil through cracks of compromise. And the pattern and the strategy unfolded in a mirror image of the fall. Genesis tells us that Eve saw that the tree was good for food. 2 Samuel 11 tells us that David saw a woman bathing. Genesis tells us that Eve coveted. The fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom. 2 Samuel 11 tells us David coveted. He sent a man to find out more about Bathsheba. Genesis tells us that Eve then took of its fruit and ate. 2 Samuel 11 then tells us that David took, he brought her to his palace and he slept with her. And finally, they hid. Adam and Eve hid from the presence of the Lord. David went to the extreme of having Uriah killed to hide what he had done. But out of both of these things, God's plan of salvation and his continuous promise to establish a royal line all the way to Jesus came out of it. Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, who had been Uriah's wife. But God used David's mistake and allowed them to have the child Solomon that was named in the direct genealogy to our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. God doesn't make mistakes, but he can use yours to bring about something great. He can use yours to bring about something glorious and wonderful in your life if you just surrender that to him. Just bring it to a close now. I'd like to invite the worship team up, if that's okay, please. There's a, there's a time in David's life when, when King David was, when David wasn't king, but he was fleeing King Saul, and he escaped him, and, and Saul had him backed into a cave. First Samuel twenty two two tells us that David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam, where his brothers and his father's household heard about it. They went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or disconnected gathered around him and, began, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. What a great, great picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone who is in distress, you can come to the cave and be with Jesus. Everyone who is in debt, who has a sin debt, you can come to the cave and be with Jesus. He has paid the debt for your sin. Everyone who is disconnected, either disconnected with the world, disconnected from their families, disconnected from their friends, disconnected from their job, disconnected from anybody that's around them, you can come to the cave and be with Jesus. I just want to close in prayer as the worship team just take over. Wherever you are this morning, wherever you're in this room, wherever you're in the kitchen, wherever you're in the bedroom, wherever you're in the living room, wherever you're in win work, wherever you might well be at the moment. If you, if you feel disconnected, if you feel in distress, if you feel that what you've done is never forgivable, it's too much, you can never be forgiven. Jesus is calling you on. He's calling you into him, to abide in him. He's calling you he has paid your debt. He has paid the debt for your sins. He's ready for you to connect to him for a unique change in your life. He's calling you to the cave to be with him. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that no 
There was a time in our lives where we were blind. But through your glory, you allowed us to see. You have unveiled the mystery of your glorious cross to us, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I just pray this morning, Holy Spirit, as you work your way, as the omnipotent God that you are, the all-present, the all-seeing God that you are, that you make your way to the hearts of the people that you have you've already ordained for the, the words of this morning to go into. And that, Lord, that they, they cry out to you this morning in their distress, in their debt of sin, in their disconnection. They cry out to you, Lord. And that knowing that you are there for them, Lord Jesus. And Lord, you bring them out of their despair and distress. And bring them, Lord, out of that season. And bring, us, bring them into new, into a new season. Into a season that is filled with your glory, Lord into a season that is guided through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, into a season that will be fruitful, Lord Jesus, because the former things are gone, new things are coming, and the latter days will be stronger and better than the, the former days. We have a promise in you, Lord Jesus, that will never pass away. You have created a room for us, place for us, a home for us in heaven. And we just thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you help us to stay connected to you. So you can have your way in and through us. So you receive all the glory. We look forward and hold on to your promises, Lord. May you receive all the glory and all the honour and all the praise. Praise you, Jesus, in your holy name.